You know, I admire people who have special skills. I love watching professionals at work. I think it's pretty awesome when someone can walk into a situation, diagnose the problem, and know what to do to solve it. You know, when, they, when that, that is who they are, and that is what they're there for, just kind of, they show up and, and bring that ability, you know, all that, that knowledge, you know, medical professionals, people with trade skills, people with uh, knowledge of, of numbers or the law or whatever that is, right? And just being able to come in and exercise that gift. I, uh, it's just the right time. They, they're able to have those gifts. They make it look easy. And I, I love seeing people who can do that. You know, once, once when we lived in Peru, <clears throat> we were interpreting for this medical mission that came down. So there's all these, these doctors and these nurses and other medical professions. They came and they set up shop and people were, were lining up and, and coming to, to get checked out, right? And so there, there they were, they, you know, folks would just show up and they'd try to diagnose the problem and do something to help them out, right, in that, in that moment. And I remember I was interpreting for this Canadian doctor and this woman came in and she said, doctor, um, I, I, um, I can't hear in my ear. Could, do you think you can help me out? I've, I'm, I've lost hearing in my ear. And so the doctor, you know, he looks in her ear, he does all this, checks her out, and then he produces this kind of strange device. It's got this like little bell on one end, this kind of metal flask on the bottom, and this plunger on the other end. And he gets warm water, fills that thing up, puts it to her ear, and whoosh, squirts the water in it. I'm just like watching all this, right? And then this huge black glop of wax goes clunk, clunk out of her ear. And she goes, I can hear again. <laughs> and I just thought, this is, this is so perfect, right? I look at this and have no idea what's going on. I fear she probably needs a hearing aid. But here, this doctor who, who shows up at the right place at the right time, he knows who he is and what he's there for, is essentially able to pull off a minor miracle and restore her hearing to her. So beautiful. Well, here we are in Jonah chapter 4, right? And something kind of like that happens. Jonah has made it to Nineveh. The destruction of the city has been forestalled by the people's repentance. But rather than being overjoyed by this turn of events, Jonah the prophet is upset. He is angry at God. And the reason Jonah is angry is because God did not dish out to Nineveh what Jonah felt Nineveh deserved. Um, Nineveh should be destroyed, and he knew. He knew this would happen, right? God is gracious and compassionate. And above all, Jonah is angry because he has forgotten who he is, what he's there for, the special skill set that God brought him to, to that moment for. He forgot his identity as part of the chosen people of God. And here, all these people just responded to the one that God had sent. And Jonah's upset that his skill set has worked. You know, Jonah has forgotten that God has blessed his people so that they can go on to bless others. Jonah forgot who he was and what he was there for. Now, Jonah's anger stands in striking contrast to God's compassion. <clears throat> At the end of chapter 3, we are told that God did not destroy the city of Nineveh because of that great compassion. Now, of course, this is exactly why God sent Jonah to Nineveh in the first place, right? Right? Because he is a God who is gracious and compassionate. He is a God who is slow to anger and abounding in love. He is a God who is always relenting from sending calamity. That's why Jonah just didn't want to go to Nineveh. He knew this was going to happen. And Jonah's nobody's fool. He knows the God who he is dealing with. You know, the gods of other nations, those other gods out there, they worry about their respective nations. So Marduk, he's worried about Babylon. He doesn't care about anybody else. Or Dagon, he's worried about Assyria, right? Yeah, every nation has its God who's worried about them to each his own. But Jonah knew that that wasn't the kind of God he was dealing with. The God of Israel also happens to be the God of all nations. The God of Israel also happens to be the God of heaven who made the sea and the land. The God of Israel 
as a God who chooses and blesses a people, not because those are the only ones he's, com- he's concerned with, not as an end in itself, but so that they can go out and bless others. That's who the God of Israel is. He promises them a land, not because it's only that parcel of real estate that he cares for, but because God chooses to use that land as ground zero for this spiraling, world-tilting mission of salvation. And we'll see that come to fruition and play out in the ministry of Jesus so many years after Jonah's time. And here's God doing that in the case of Nineveh, through his chosen prophet Jonah. Here's God blessing a nation that it was not supposedly his nation through one of his chosen people. There's just one problem. This chosen person didn't choose to go along with the mission. And this is where things get interesting in the book of Jonah, You know, chapter 4, it's really like a parable. And God puts questions to Jonah, and Jonah in turn challenges God. And there's this back and forth. And the whole book, in fact, ends on a question. God says, shouldn't I be concerned for the lives of all of these people and all of these animals? And what's interesting is that the salvation of a nation and the salvation of one man, Jonah, They're overlaid. God, it turns out, is not just trying to save Nineveh. God's trying to save Jonah. Now, sure, Jonah's eternal salvation might not be in play here. That's not really the question on the table. But what is at stake is the kind of person that Jonah will be. Can Jonah grow as a person who is gracious and merciful and compassionate, just like the God he serves? Or is Jonah going to be this bitter man who resents God, good, God's goodness to others. And God, God wants to see Jonah become fully who God has created him to be. And Jonah's just not sure that he wants to go down that path. So in chapter 4, if you're following along, verse 3, Jonah says, Now, O Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Jonah would rather be dead than see Nineveh redeemed. Now, God says, have you any right to be angry? Verse 4. And you know, this, this, this God puts a question to him, and it, it reminds me so much of the way that Jesus teaches. And we're, we're looking at this in our adult Sunday school class, right? So often, Jesus uses questions to challenge people's assumptions, to test their commitments, to help them figure out who they are, who they believe God to be. And here's God, sounding just like Jesus, you know, coincidence there, uh, putting questions to to Jonah. You know, just look at that. Like verse 4, have you any right to be angry? Verse 9, God says, do you have a right to be angry about the vine? Verse 11, at the the end of that verse, God says, "Um, should I not be concerned about this great city? You know, and, and, and Jonah, Jonah's responding in each of these cases, he's responding that he's angry, that he's angry enough to die. Jonah's saying, God, just make me disappear. And not only does God engage in this dialogue with Jonah, putting questions to Jonah, using the life of the city as this kind of a parable, but God also turns Jonah's situation into this sort of living parable. So verse 5, God says, you know, Jonah, he he goes outside of the city. Um, He sits down to the east of the city, builds himself this, this little shelter, And there he waits to see what's going to happen. You know, maybe God will still turn things around. Maybe God will still recognize, after all, Nineveh's great sin. Maybe God will just decide, hey, I'm I'm going to destroy this city. Verse 6, we see Jonah as he waits. God provides a vine. So as Jonah's waiting, this vine springs up. Now, depending on your translation, the word there may read vine, might read leafy plant or bush or gourd or ivy. Maybe you've got something else, right, than all these things. The Hebrew word is kikayon. That's the word up there, kikayon. And kikayon, this is the only place in the whole Bible that the word kikayon is used, which means that there's no other reference. There's no other place where someone describes the characteristics of a kikayon. No one knows what kind of plant this is. Does it produce some kind of food? 
Is a kikeon wild or cultivated? Nobody knows. All that we know is that it grows miraculously fast, has leaves that are big enough to provide shelter from the sun. But what is it? Well, it's a kikeon. That's what it is. It's just that's all we know. It's a kikeon. And Jonah, he loves this mysterious shady plant. Jonah loves his kikeon. So verse 6 um, the Lord provided a vine that Kikion made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. Jonah, he was very happy about the vine, right? But it turns out that God didn't so much send that Kikion to shade Jonah so much as to instruct Jonah. Verse 7, but at dawn, the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the vine so that it withered. And so with nothing but a rickety shelter, Jonah has little protection from the sun, and he grows faint, wants to die. And now God has him just where he wants him. And he puts the question to Jonah, verse 9, Do you have a right to be angry about that, Kikion? I do, said Jonah. I am angry enough to die. God has him right where he wants him. And you have to sort of admire Jonah's response, right? Do you have a right to be angry about that vine? Oh, I do, right? I am angry. I'm angry enough to die. And then verse 10 and 11, here's the clincher. God says, you have been concerned about this vine, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people. They can't tell their right hand from their left. And there's many cattle or many animals. Should I not be concerned about that great city? Right, Jonah, you're all worried about this little vine. Look at me, I'm worried about this whole city. It's this gotcha moment, right? But there's a lot of compassion here because, you know, Jonah's, Jonah's reaction is not recorded in the book of Jonah. And in some ways, the readers of this book, the Hebrew people, uh, you know, in some ways the question is put to them, shouldn't I be concerned about this great city? Shouldn't God be concerned about this great city? Shouldn't you, as the Hebrew people, be concerned about this great city of Nineveh? And it's hard to know exactly you know, when the people of Israel would have found themselves reading this book. But I think for, for sure, one thing, one thing is clear. They would have known about Nineveh. And Nineveh would have been understood to them as this existential threat, as this imperial city with a dangerous penchant for invading and conquering and destroying, for absorbing the peoples around them. But if God is the God of the whole world, shouldn't he have been worried about Nineveh? I mean, Jonah's behavior, it's so typical, right? It's just, it's a really human response, which is part of why this story is so powerful and endearing. I mean, there's the kikion, this kikion plant. It's right in front of him. And he, in some sense, he believes that this plant kind of belongs to him, right? It's, it's it, this plant, this little kikion, it somehow seems more important to him, maybe because it's right in front of him, than that whole city full of strangers. And I wonder how often do we do the same thing? You know, people far away, disasters far away. We, we read about them in the news, but do they seem as real to us as the thing or the animal or the event or the person that's, that's right in front of us, right? And it's much more real than some nebulous city halfway around the world. Sometimes this very human reality can take some strange turns. So, for instance, as a nation, um, last year we spent half a billion dollars, that's $500 million on Halloween costumes for pets. Um, and at the same time, there's half a million families that are fleeing violence and poverty in Central America who have been picked up on our southern border in the last year. And, you know, the two are not mutually exclusive. I'm making it overly simplistic, but it just seems to me this kind of example of the sort of topsy-turvy, crazy kind of world that we live in, right? Like, what matters to us as, as a people? And here's God saying to Jonah, what are you so focused on this kikion plant for? I mean, look at the city of Nineveh. This city is filled with people and animals. What about them? It's a shame. God calls Jonah out on the carpets. And, you know, up to this point, it's always been about mission. It's always been about the people of Nineveh. But here it gets personal. Here's where God is asking Jonah, hey, look at your own heart, Jonah. Where are you at? Here's where the book of Jonah I think it really should challenge all of us. Do we see others, other 
people, other nations, our neighbors down the street, do we see others with the same eyes of compassion that God has for them? Are we concerned about their welfare as God is? And you know, Jonah doesn't seem to be that concerned at this moment for anything beyond his little kikion. And partly, I think this is because he knew Nineveh deserved to be punished. And Jonah must have felt a kind of injustice in his whole mission. And you know, it's true. A hundred years later, the prophet Nahum will come along and Nahum will prophesy that Nineveh is going to be destroyed. He'll prophesy Nineveh's downfall. And there, there is no more Nineveh. It's just ruins. It's in modern-day Iraq, but it's not a great city anymore. But God's message is one of mercy. God's message is one of compassion. And that's what Jonah was tasked to bring to the people of Nineveh, and he just doesn't like it. And he's never gotten over the hard fact of it. And let's be honest. We might not always be completely convinced ourselves about God's mercy I mean, we probably want God to be merciful to us, but when it comes to other people, hey, we want justice. And listen, it's true, justice, justice is a biblical value. The prophet Habakkuk says, how long until God grants justice for his people? You know, the saints under the altar in the book of Revelation, they say, how long, God, until you grant justice? God told Micah that if you want to live rightly, do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. I mean, we need justice. Justice is wired right into the human soul. And so when justice is denied, when someone gets away with something, we're upset. We need justice. This is why the law of the Old Testament, um, God, God said in the law of the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 16, 20, justice and only justice you shall pursue so that you may live and occupy the land that the Lord your God has given you. This is why the people praise King Solomon. They say the wisdom of God was in him to execute justice. This is why Hosea said, return to your God, hold fast to love and justice, wait continually for our God. It's why God told the Israelites that they're to use just weights, just measures, treat the poor with dignity, the weak with respect, care and give justice to the immigrants and orphans and widows. He says it's why they all must hate evil, love good, establish justice in the gate. That's Amos. Justice is good for human beings. It's something that, that we need, like food and shelter. And we desire justice, and we seek justice, and we long for justice because God is a God of justice. And we're told that he shows no partiality, and we have been created in his image. So we need justice. But so too, and here's the hang-up for Jonah, so too we long for mercy. And I think there is this tension between justice and between mercy and maybe it's only God that knows how to hold them together rightly. And this is, this is part of the scandal of mercy. You know, mercy makes sense if, if the wrong doesn't seem that bad, or if we don't believe the person did it, or if it's us, or if it's someone who we love, then, you know, then, then we're all about mercy. But when it's a deep and horrific wrong, mercy can seem scandalous indeed. Mercy can seem an affront and that's what Jonah's feeling. You know, in some ways, who can blame him? Jonah looked at Nineveh, and he, he, he looked at this, this great city filled with violence, and he worked the scales of justice and mercy, and he came down on the side of justice. And Jonah failed to conceive that God could be both just and show mercy to the city of Nineveh. But you know, Jonah's bigger failure, the, his root failure, is really forgetting what it means to be part of the chosen people of God. You know, to be blessed by God means that we have a calling to bless others. The nation of Israel, they had they'd forgotten that. And Jonah's book, this story, is meant to kind of provide a shock to wake them back up to that. They, the nation had imagined that they were chosen and blessed as an end in itself. But who they were, and what they were there for, their special skill set was to be a blessing to all nations. Just as God had said to Abraham way back in Genesis 12, that when God chose him, when this whole chosen people business got rolling, he said, I'm going to bless those who bless you. I'm going to bless the whole world through you. God blesses his people so they can go on to bless others. And God shows mercy to us so that we can show mercy to others. 
This is part of what makes church so difficult. It's why it's so hard to be a part of the people of God. It's because of all the goodness that God has shown us, all the love that we have done, all the nurture we have received, all the grace and forgiveness and mercy, it's all meant for us to share. We are blessed to bless. We are graced to grace. As Jesus told the apostles, freely you have received, freely give. And what this means, what this means is that whatever goodness we've received, we've received it to share with others even those who we might not wish that we would have to share them with. It's like Jonah and the Ninevites. And you know, I'm not just talking about money or stuff. I'm talking about the gifts that God has given us, our talents, what we have learned across our lives, our unique capabilities. They are all intended to be exercised and directed away from us toward the glory of God, toward the benefit of others. I think about the great composer, and musician J.S. Bach. You know, everybody's heard of Bach, right? You've heard of Bach? Um, you know, J.S. Bach, he was one of the greatest and most beloved, or he is one of the greatest and most beloved musicians who has ever lived. And yet, he was remarkably humble. Bach is said to have once told a piano student um, who asked for some advice. He said, look, he told this student, look, you've got five fingers on each hand just like I do. All you've got to do is practice and things will turn out fine, which, hey, if Bach tells you that, you know, all you got to do is practice, it must be true. But Bach also said this, music's only purpose should be the glory of God and the recreation of the human spirit. As writer and composer Patrick Kavanaugh puts it, for Bach, music was about blessing the Lord and blessing others. That was who Bach was. He showed up and brought that to, to the scene. And what that means is that all of us, at some point, we're all going to be Jonah. We're all going to have skills like Bach or whoever. We're all, we all got that choice, Jonah's choice. We're all going to be sitting outside of Nineveh, and God's going to be trying to, to get us to go back in, share what we have. God's blessed us to bless others. That's who we are, what God has brought us to this place for. And the question will be, how will we respond to God's invitation? You know, what is your gifting? What is your skill set? Who has God made you? Where have you grown? What is a way that you can take that to bless others? What is a gift that you have received in your life that you can use to bless others? Because to be the people of God, to be blessed is to go on and bless others. To be graced is to go on and grace others. To be given is to go on and share with others. And you know, I don't know, maybe... Maybe this is part of why the book of Jonah has this kind of wide open ending. You know, it ends on this question. God has told us where his heart is. It's this wide open ending. We know where God's heart is. God's shown us the path of his mercy. And so we have Jonah's choice to make. God has put the question to us just like he did to Jonah. And he's essentially saying, are you coming with me or not?